Okay. Welcome to our Suffolk Library Day Online Book Festival. I'm Lisa, I'm your host, and I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries. Our annual fundraising day, Suffolk Libraries Day, is vitally important to us, so we really appreciate support and donations for that. Thank you so much. And for this evening's author event, I'm delighted to introduce the historical fiction author, who's awesome, Matthew <laughs> Happy. <Apparently>. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And it's great to be here. And yeah, it does say it does say more on the T-shirt. But yeah, I like the fact that it just is awesome. Yeah. You're just like awesome. That's just who you are. It's yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> um, I wanted to sort of go back a bit um, with you first off, Matthew, of like where did that spark really came from for that first series? And I think it was a documentary you watched about Northumbria back in 2001. That's right. Yeah, I watched. Uh, it, was, it was yeah in October. I remember it was in October in 2001, and I. Um, yeah, I watched this documentary and it was about um, skeletons being dug up near Bamborough Castle. Um, and they talked about the fact that these, these skeletons were from the 7th century or before. And they talked about Bernicia and the fact that Northumberland or Northumbria was part of, um, well, Bernicia was part of Northumbria. And Bernicia was, a, was a, a kingdom at the time and Northumbria was a very important kingdom. And, and I didn't really know much about this. I'd lived um, near Bamburgh as a, as a child for a few years mm -hmm. and I'd been to Bamburgh Castle and I didn't really know much about it. And um, I started hearing all this stuff about how um, Bamburgh Castle was, Bebenburg was the um, seat of the kings of Northumbria for many years. And um, it really sparked my imagination. And I, that night, really without thinking, I went off and started writing. Um, the first what what turned into the first chapter of, of the serpent sword um, after many many years it became the serpent sword but I, I, I didn't really understand quite how much work was involved in um, in writing a, a historical fiction novel at the time so it took me a few years that first one but, yeah. as you say it was like the first book the serpent sword did That's you right, yeah. think then do you have any idea that that would end up turning into like an 11 book series um no no um, basically no <laughs> frankly, frankly I didn't. no i had the idea originally was um so the serpent sword follows a, the, well the whole series the benicia chronicles follows a character called um, beobrand and he travels from kent which is kantwara in the seventh century and he travels up to, to northumbria um and later on he becomes a warrior and it all goes on and i thought that i was going to write one book that was going to be his whole life um, he starts off the first book at 17 years old. He finishes the first book at about 18, probably, or maybe just 17 and a half or something. He's, he's basically about a year older. Um, and I thought, maybe um, this is going to be more than one book. I, no, I was very naive. I don't really know. At the beginning, I had no idea how long a book was. And I started after you, I'd written a few for a few years. I thought I better check how long a book is. And it was like a novel is more than 70,000 words or something. And historical fiction is normally a bit longer. And so I thought, OK, I should aim for 100,000 words. And as I say, when I hit 100,000 words, it was like basically I'd covered six months of the guy's life. And I thought probably this is going to be a series. It's going to take a bit longer. And you said, obviously, there was a, a time period before when you first started watching, like, writing that and was so inspired yeah. to it being published. Now, it was a long how, time. And yeah, because <laughs> uh, we do have a lot of um, like body people that are just starting writing that, that watch some of these videos. So, like, how did you persevere with it? So, well, I, I actually, I mean, you mentioned Bernard Cornwall earlier. So he, he features in my story, actually. So um, I'd read... Bernard Cornwell's sharp books and other novels of his before and the thing one of the books one of his series that really um inspired me were the Arthurian novels that he wrote um I think they were called the Warlord Chronicle I'm not sure now they've all changed names but you know, the Arthur the Arthur books he had a trilogy of books about Arthur and he wrote them in the mid-90s and I loved them and they were very gritty and that was I think that was kind of one of my major inspirations of to, to write and um so I then started writing this this book set in Bebenberg with this young warrior and um, I pressed on with it. I was working full time. I was studying for a degree with the Open University. I had a young family, so I had lots of things going on. I had no time at all, really. So it took me a long time. For the first couple of years, I was just sort of researching and writing slowly, picking away at it. And then Bernard Cornwell brought out The Last Kingdom, which was very, very similar in terms of it starts in Bebenberg with a young warrior. Slightly different time periods, a couple of hundred years later. And really, I, it totally took the wind out of my sails. And I think this is something that happens to many writers, actually, mm -hmm. especially when you're starting out, that somebody else will publish something that is you know, similar. And I'm, I'm not accusing 
anyone of plagiarism or copying anybody or anything like that. But somebody will bring something out that, that kind of sits in a similar space. And, you know, if you're writing a crime novel set in London or something, somebody else might bring a book out set in London with a, with a, with a similar type of detective or something and it's it's very difficult at that moment just to go brilliant I'm just going to carry on it's great Bernard Cornwall's just written a book that everyone's going to think that I've copied but this is fine so really I mean the re the reality is I put it aside for years I put it down I said I'm, uh, that's it I can't I can't write it and I didn't write for about seven years and oh, then wow. and then it was 2012 2012 2013 somewhere around there and E.L. James had, had become massive with Fifty Shades of Grey and she'd self-published that book. And um, and I'd read, heard on the radio or something, she was making a million dollars a week or something being self-published. And I thought, wow, that sounds, that sounds good. Um, maybe I should do that. And self-publishing had become a thing. And so I mm -hmm. thought, well, you know what? I can write this book. And if, if I don't manage to find a publisher, I can self-publish it. Because I worked in technical publications at the time. So I knew about this, you know, technology and how to do it, the, the, the software and stuff. So I thought, well, I can do that myself be fine I could, so I thought I'll write it I'll try and get an agent and a publisher and if I don't I'll self-publish it which is what I ended up doing but the the I think that the fact that self-publishing became an option um, really was the spark that sort of reignited my um, my passion really and I thought okay I, I didn't want to write and then not be able to publish I thought that mm -hmm. I, I, and I know lots and lots of writers throughout history <clears throat> and now you know we'll write and then never publish books that just don't get picked up or whatever and and I just I just couldn't bear the thought of spending years of my life working and then not doing anything with with the out with the product so um having that ability to be able to self-publish really made the difference and I did self-publish in the end I didn't find a publisher so this is again for prospective um, writers that are listening I did have to self-publish I got an agent I found an agent we put the book out there tried to get publishing deals but rejected by everybody I wrote the sequel while that was happening. So by the time I'd been rejected by everybody, I'd written The Cross and the Curse, which was the sequel. At which point, you know, the agent said, well, everyone's passed, you know, that's it, on to the next thing. And I said, well, hang on a minute. So <laughs> I'm going to self-publish it. So I self-published The Serpent Sword. Um, and then I self-published The Cross and the Curse. And while just by about the time The Cross and the Curse came out, the agent then lined up a, a, a conversation with a new publisher and I got, I got the publishing deal. We took those books off of self-publishing and then traditionally published them and then the rest is history what was it like for you when you then got that deal locked in when your agent called you and went Matthew we've done it what was it that was, like it was a very strange situation I was actually working I was still working full-time at the at the time and um I was in India actually and I was and um because I, I, I worked in this in a big international company and I managed a team of people um in India and I and I was out in India actually um at, at work and I was I, it was like crazy o'clock in the morning or something and I was sending emails to the you know sort of talking about negotiating the contract and whether I, you know I should take this or can we ask for this and it was very strange but it was it was great I mean it was it was it was actually a difficult situation a difficult decision to make at that time because I was doing quite well with the self-publishing so and and so I had to really look at it and think you know is this the right thing for me but long term because, because obviously the, was, yeah. uh, the publishing house take a uh, percentage in a way that obviously doesn't occur with self-publishing but then exactly, they can get yeah. the reach so it's kind of balancing that isn't it and it was exactly that and it was looking at it as a long-term prospect and thinking you know actually maybe I don't make as much money for each individual book sold but hopefully there'll be much more um, distribution and I'll get, you know, wider audience and, and maybe other things like translations and, you know, different formats and audio books and things like that. And, and, and those things have come to pass. So, but it's, it, it is a very long, slow, um, you know, process and the business is very slow moving. So it can get frustrating, even once you've got the, the deal and you're writing, you know, it can feel a little bit anticlimactic sometimes, you know, the book goes out and then it's like, okay, now what? And, you know, onto the next one and, and and you don't see much traction sometimes and so that can be quite difficult I think as well but well you said about it being um a bit surreal when you got that phone call and I think um you got a slightly surreal experience from James Faulkner messaged you on <laughs> yes. Facebook oh yes yeah you've been doing your research yeah so um James Faulkner is yeah, um, a keen uh, reenactor and historian and um and a fan of the books and he's really into anglo -Sax the anglo-saxon period and vikings and and um and, and sort of living history and things and he he contacted me out of the blue and said have you sold the rights to the serpent sword um or any of your books to tv or, or film and 
I just I thought he was a bit of a nutter really and I just sort of thought because you, 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 you get contacted by people yeah. every now and again and most people are great but sometimes you get some strange co people contact you with sort of strange requests or strange comments and you sort of shrug your shoulders and think okay well you know what whatever and so I just sort of I, I you know I, I humored him and sort of said no 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 um but you know whatever and he, and he said um well it, would, could I could I sort of look into into maybe putting a team together to start thinking about doing it you know, adapting it for tv or, or something and i sort of thought okay i don't know who this guy is but i sort of said yeah okay whatever and and, I, and then he went away and like a couple of months later he then came back to me and and then we started talking seriously and his brother-in-law um actually works um, in in the industry as an actor and he's done some production work and he was working with a small production company called cinemas in in south wales and we talked to them got them on board and long story short but basically you know we went we went through lots of <laughs> conversations and um, Cinemurse came on board um, and we got a, a, a script writer um, and, and he came on board as well. And um, yeah, and we're trying to get it made into a series. It sounds like at this point um, it, it's all rosy and, and the millions of dollars are rolling in. But actually, that's pretty much we got to a point that we did a proof of concept trailer. So if anyone wants mm. to watch it, you can, see, awesome. you can see it. So it's it all, is great. You, you just managed to get it before lockdown finished. So it was literally, like, yeah. I, couldn't get, I couldn't attend the last day of filming because the lockdown was like imminent. And so they had the minimum number of people on set, but we filmed over like eight days in early 2020. And um, it's a two minute trailer. So if people want to go and see that, you can see it on my website, matthewharfey.com, or you can see the serpentsword.com. So we put together this, this proof of concept trailer and then we've been trying to kind of get it under the, the noses of the right people in Hollywood or somewhere who've got money um, to actually make a, a series out of it. Um, and we've had some interesting meetings and we've talked to a few different people and it's kind of strange meeting people on Zoom um, and, and chatting to people. But so far, I mean, these things are notoriously difficult. So, so far, it's a, it's a slow process and, and it, 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 it can take a while but i think you even got to speak to actors that were involved with things like game of thrones who yeah I mean, greg stewart is the one that's written some of the scripts and they're that's right yes yes from, yeah. what was that like so it was um yeah it was it was great i think i think in in some ways lockdown um helped us and it made it easier to access people so we were trying to access i think in, in some ways it was a bit annoying that we hadn't had everything ready six months before we did because i think if we'd hit that first lockdown and we'd had everything ready because we didn't have the trailer edited and and ready to go so we were we were you know we it took a couple of months to get the music done and the sound done and everything so it was we were sort of well into into the first lockdown by the time everything was ready but i think if we you know if we got early on we maybe would have had more chance of selling it because i think or you know quite quickly because many many production houses were sort of desperate for content they thought that you know everyone was signing up to netflix and disney plus and and everything like that but but reaching out to actors we were we were sort of at, at that time we were talking about trying to attach actors to it to see if we could get names you know attached and we'd contact lots of people you know the, their agents just said no we're not interested because you haven't got any money behind it so we don't want to talk to you but um but we talked to some pretty recognizable people from big series like outlander um actor that's um going to be in the new lord of the rings he was in um um he was in uh, new zealand at the time he's locked down in new zealand he was just desperate to talk to to talk to people you know and so we were just chatting to to these actors and you know actresses in in um we uh, an actress who's in outlander um lottie lot of Beck. she was um in uh, in uh, um the netherlands and we were talking to her so we were just basically talking to people all over the world and production companies that i think would not have opened their doors to us as easily if it hadn't been for the fact that everyone was locked down and at home and we spoke to we spoke to like BAFTA award-winning directors and people, you know, sent them the script and they and they read it, you know, came back and said, yeah, yeah, we loved it, you know, I'll direct this tomorrow. So it looked at that time, it looked like by the end of lockdown we were going to have the thing greenlit, you know, but <laughs> things have slowed down a bit since then. <laughs> Well, I think as well, there's like a big backlog as well, isn't there? Exactly, for things yeah. that have already. So like yeah. um, last year, I interviewed Sarah Vaughan for our book festival mm -hmm. and her series is only, it was coming out next month. Right. So it's about 14 months late um, on the schedule um, than what it should have been. Exactly, um, yeah. There's a huge think, backlog, yeah. Yeah, but I think that's very exciting. You know, I think it would look amazing. And, the, you know, when Matthew mentioned the trailer, do check it out, guys, because it's superb. And it really it is, does it give is a really feel. Great. I mean, all the, all the team that were involved in it were fantastic. And we did it basically for no money at all. And it was all done on favours and, and people, you know, professionals just giving their time and working 
um, really hard and doing a great, great job. So yeah, check it out and see what you think and leave us yeah, a comment definitely. on YouTube if you watch it there. And like hopefully a TV series coming from that soon. That'd be good. Um, oh, obviously we're talking about that first series, but you've just had a new book come out in, well, the second book in your new series. And I know that um, David Gemmell and the book Legend um, planted that seed for you, I think, for this new series. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so definitely... Um, the inspiration of the first one in the series is oh, i've got it here look the first one is a is a time for swords we could both do the book the book showing thing i uh, look we look at <laughs> that so so the first one in the series is called a time for swords and the the series is um called a time for swords because we couldn't think of anything better than that but the um the first one yes it's um so legend um by by the late great um david gemmel is about um a small group of warriors defending against an overwhelming force um that's the basic premise of it and in so there's there's elements of, of that and there's also elements of like the seven samurai and the magnificent seven which is the same story really which is a small band of warriors who stand up against a, a bigger force that are coming to attack the village and in this that, that those were the two things really that kind of inspired this so in the end what it is it's historical fiction but with a with a capital f on the fiction um where the main character is um hunlaf and he's a monk who is there at the very first viking raid on lindisfarne in 793 he witnesses the the viking attack and he discovers that where all the other monks are running away or getting hacked down, he actually picks up a knife and um, sort of gets stuck in and tries to defend them. And after that, um, he, there's lots of things happen, but he, he he tries to put together a motley crew of, of people to defend another monastery, which is the monastery that he comes from further down the coast. It's actually a fictional monastery um, at Walkworth. Um, Walkworth exists, but um, as far as we know, there wasn't a monastery there, but... Um, I've created a monastery there because you can do those sort of things in in fiction um, and yes and so that's the first one and they so they build up this defense um, against the Vikings that they know are coming and the sequel to that is the one that's just come out which is A Night of Flames um, which is which which basically starts where the other one left off um, and they are building a ship and then heading off um, in search of different um, people and and things that um, have been sort of taken away after the first book and they're going to head towards um, Norway eventually so by the end of that book they're in Norway and they have a an adventure in Norway. Brilliant I just saw <laughs> the things that have come through so Sarah thank you for joining us Matthew's books are awesome so you're in for a treat um, and Peter said he's just finished reading A Time for Swords he loved yep. the Magnificent Seven Vibes because I know you're a big western fan aren't you Matthew yep. Um, yep. Peter's also a big fan of Bernard Cornwall's Arthur books and he's asked faith and religion is a massive part of both books is that intentional and um, what would Bio Band think of his ancestor being a monk? Uh -huh. So well, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I um I don't know what Beobrand would think <laughs> about that, really. Although Beobrand's got nothing really against the Christians per se. He's not like Utrecht, where Utrecht is very mm. sort of, um, against the Christians. I mean, but Beobrand is a bit more like whatever. I don't really, I don't, I don't think Beobrand really cares too much. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what you think about that. But yeah, religion, religion is a big deal in, in the mm. books, um, and I think it's a big deal in, and it's a, an important part of the Benicia Chronicles too. And more than anything, I think it's because in the time, in the early medieval period and in the medieval period, and in fact, even in you know, many, many places in the world now, um, religion is very, very important um, and was incredibly important and everybody believed it. So there's a point when you go back in history, um, you know, a couple of hundred years, there, there were really no atheists. Everybody believed in religion. Um, and so it, uh, in one form or another. And so religion was extremely important and of course the church was very rich um and was a hugely important political force as well so there's always going to be those machinations between the the, the church and, and the state and people are really going to be fearful for their for their souls and for you know what's going to happen to them and i think anybody that writes something based in the medieval period and doesn't cover religion or at least you know have the characters are, aren't religious it's really quite a, a false impression of, of what the time would be like and in fact probably my books they're not as religious as they would be i'm sure they'd be even more religious really but um yeah 
I really love um, how Unlaf has that sort of conflict between being a monk and a warrior, and and that's brilliant in the book. And I felt that at times, I hope this makes sense. What I'm about to say that it didn't feel like you'd written the book, Matthew. It felt like I was reading his life story. Well, that's 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 the best praise. Okay, that's the best praise right. ever. Does that make sense? Yeah, I didn't really that's, feel that's like that's fantastic. It was yeah. No, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so my, my, my dad actually said when I sent him the first draft of um, A Time for Swords and my dad um, said it made him cry um, because because it's all at the end he's talking about because he's writing it from the perspective of when he's old um, and he's writing it as an old man and saying, I can't do these things now. And I never thought that I'd grow old. And, and my dad is, is 80 this year. And he said it made him really upset thinking about how real it is how true it is that and then he went on to say he went <laughs> this was like a year ago he then went on to say so he was 78 i think and he then said yes because the other day i was doing some work in the garden and i had to buy some cement and i could only carry one 25 kilo bag at a time and in the past i would have had one under each arm and run down the steps and i was like okay thanks dad i can't do that now <laughs> I, I don't think i could do that <laughs> Um, David's asked a really good question, which is um, similar to something I wanted to ask about, which, which is like letting go of one series and starting another. So he said like, he, he loves the subtle nods to new series back to Brio Brand and the Serpent Sword series. And was it hard to step away from him? So that's interesting because at the moment I'm actually writing, um, I'm just finishing writing book nine of the Benicia Chronicles at the moment. So I am kind of leapfrogging between them. I'm I'm still writing the Benicia Chronicles at the moment, so um, I think there's probably going to be another two or three um, in the Benicia Chronicles before that series is finished. So I haven't stepped away completely. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this sort of like one of one, one of the other. Um, the first book that I wrote that wasn't a Benicia Chronicles book was Wolf of Wessex, which you can see mm -hmm. up there on the shelf, and that's a standalone at the moment. And the reason for wanting to do something different really was just that it was wanting to do something different. So I just got to the point, you, you don't want to kind of repeat yourself too much. And it becomes quite difficult to write a series of books about the same characters in the same time frame, the same sort of adventures without inevitably repeating yourself. And even if you're not repeating yourself to the point that it's annoying for the readers because they're only picking it up and reading it over three or four days you know, maybe even just a few hours for the fast readers. Um, and then they put it down and they pick up another book like six months later or a year later and read it. So they don't maybe get bored with it. But as a writer, when you spend months writing the book and then you move on to the next Benicia Chronicles book and the same characters and very you know similar sort of things happening, and then the next one and then the next one, it becomes difficult to, to sort of invigorate yourself and feel excited about it not that the stories aren't exciting but you just kind of think oh I've done this before and and so uh, I'm all, I, I, I basically I thought I want to do something a bit different for myself um to see if I can and sort of test the waters with Wolf of Wessex and that went really well and people really liked it um and then I thought okay I'm going to try to write basically with each book I try and do something a bit different so the the Benicia Chronicles they're all third written in third person and sort of an omnipresent third person because you get different points of view so you'll have bear brand one chapter and then you have a chapter from maybe maybe his love interest son of her in the first book will have a chapter to herself then you'll have maybe some of the bad characters you know the, the baddies will have chapters written from their perspective and ken red the monk will have chapters from his perspective so it's very sort of omniscient um and then so with wolf of wessex i narrowed it right down i, I just had two point of view characters a, a the, the man Druss and a young girl um, and and alternated their chapters and with um, a time for swords I thought well I'm going to write a slightly different time frame um, a slightly different time period but I want to write that all in first person so again it was a challenge to myself really to do something different so I thought if I write that in first person and then I write the Benicia Chronicles in third person that that differentiates them to some extent and in fact mm. I literally today finished my first read through of the new Benicia Chronicles book which is called Forest of Foes and um, there was a couple of times where towards the end, when I'm obviously getting excited in some final battle scene, I'd written it in first person. So I'd always <laughs> sort of... <laughs> so sort of slipped in and it's, gone, it's, Yeah, yeah. So I think when it starts getting very immediate and you feel like you're really in the action, it's easy to write it in first person. So you start writing, you know, and I saw this and I did this and I ran over there and you're sort of in the action. Um, but anyway, so I don't... Yes, yeah, so I don't think it's difficult to differentiate them. I think the, the, the more of the difficulty is now thinking about potentially writing in a completely different time frame. So at the moment mm -hmm. I'm writing, it's all early medieval, 
Um, so it's, I've written in the 6th century, 7th, 8th century and, and 9th century. So Wolf of Wessex is 9th century. So they're all 9th century or before. But I'd quite like to write something in a totally different time period. And then that's a whole different sort of thing, you know, because I, I can... I can write in a different style perhaps and use different similes and metaphors that you can't use you know well i think when you talk about your standalone wolf of um wessex before i think you said that that you found that that flowed a lot easier um and that somehow it was easier to write do you think that was because you knew going in it was a standalone you didn't have to go okay whatever i do to this person's going to affect the next book and the next book possibly i think it's partly as well because uh, what tends to happen with the Benicia books is that I find historical events and I try to intertwine them into the story, but I end up having to write about the historical events and create all this plot around Beobrand. So it becomes quite convoluted. There's lots of things going on and it all sort of works out in the end. And it seems to, you know, it seems to, to work, but it's a lot of, there's a lot of things happening, a lot of threads to kind of tie together. Whereas in the Wolf of Wessex, it was quite a simple premise. There's a, it starts off, the very first line is Druss, um, Druss, <laughs> Dunstan, that's my Freudian slip. So he's like Druss from legend, from David Gemmell's legend. Um, <laughs> but this this old ax man, so he's very, very much my nod to, to Druss from, from legend. But um, always back to David Gemmell at the end. But anyways, it starts off with Dunstan, the, the old woodsman with his ax, finding um you know dead body in the forest and it's all about then finding out that the, the girl um that he finds is is the um the, the daughter of the of the murdered man and him basically trying to to find justice and then sort of uncovering intrigues and then escorting this girl a, across across wessex and in, in trying to to get get her to safety and to to sort of save the day but it's a very simple thread so it's easier to there, mm -hmm. there's no deviation it's just the two of them they're the only point of view characters and it just rattles along and it's, it's i think it's the shortest book i've written as well so they it's a thriller really it's a thriller uh, or a western it's really a western i mean it's like you know it's, they, they're traveling it's a bit like true grit i described it as true grit meets legend meets ray mears uh, meets the vikings in uh, in the dark ages yeah. i love that um well mike before the event said that he loves your books and he wanted to know if you'd ever write in a different genre when you just said that or anything of it and i think you might have dabbled in a bit of science fiction i have actually although it's not been published yet so it's a bit i um, know i was looking and i was like yeah i, I i'm looking as well i, I mean they, they paid can you me tell anyone what the title <laughs> of it is yet i'm not allowed to i'm not allowed oh to my so goodness. no I'm, I'm not allowed to but i will say that um if it does ever get published i mean it was it was I think I could say who who bought it. <laughs> so yeah, no, you have before. Okay, before so it was, it was yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's been so long now. I've kind of forgotten about it. But um, yeah, it was commissioned by um, Games Workshop by the Black Library, um, and they said to me, "Well, you can write a short story about the fantasy um, side of our gaming worlds, or Warhammer." Because they do Warhammer, so so you can write about Warhammer, the fantasy stuff. I think it's Age of Sigma or um or warhammer 40,000 which is science fiction it's set in the year 40,000 now i've never played warhammer so i i don't know anything about it so i thought you know what it'd be a bit more exciting to write something in sci-fi um and they said okay you can do that and they they then asked me to pitch an idea and i pitched i thought wow i've got to now tell you what i what i want to write about i don't know so anyway i came up with a with an idea and i and they sent me then like an encyclopedia <laughs> pdf of like about 200 pages and said oh that's that will get you started there's a wikipedia page basically a whole wikipedia all about their their world and say you know there you go off you go write this thing so so yeah it was it was more difficult than writing historical fiction because i didn't know anything about the like the history of the world but they've been writing these novels and playing these you know creating these games for 30 years or, or more so there's so much i mean there's hundreds and hundreds of novels and the amount of lore behind this world is incredible and so I, I had to go through three or four iterations of it. It's only a short story, but um, I will say I managed to get a few nods to Beobrand and the Benicia Chronicles in there as well. So anyone, when it does come out, hopefully it's going to come out in some sort of anthology. They, they said it was going to come out in their, one of their anthologies of short stories where they try out new new authors, you know, in the in the in the genre. So it's quite exciting. Lots of stuff happens. <laughs> There's lots of fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered, like, obviously, because it's like that science fiction, when you said about all the law, it's like you had to do research, but in a different kind of way to be able to write the book. Um, did you enjoy sort of tackling that kind of genre? 
because it's, it it's quite different. I enjoyed the fact that it was uh, that I realised the more that I got into it that I was free, apart from the specifics, like the names of weapons or the, you know things that are specific to the law, um, like the names of tanks or whatever. I don't know things like that. Apart from that, I was pretty much free to write anything. So it really is freeing you know it's like fantasy you can just write anything really so i think that's I, I i enjoyed that element of it so that i could just tell the story i wanted to tell um but it was a very hands-on process from the editor and there was a lot of um a lot of rewrites yeah it took me ages i mean it took me it was much much more difficult than it than it was to write historical fiction because i think the historical fiction fans are probably more lenient than the warhammer fans are oh, yeah, in terms probably. of accuracy so, I mean, the, the the editor was like, well, you can't say that, and this isn't right, and, you know, so there's loads of things like that. But no, I really, I did really enjoy it. Um, it was just a little bit, yeah, difficult. <laughs> but I did enjoy it. I want to see it come out, and I want to see what, what the fans, you know, people who um, who actually play the games think of, of it. I've, so far, only one person who actually, James Faulkner, who I mentioned, who you mentioned before, the, um, the, he's, a, he's a keen Warhammer player as well. So I actually let him read it, so... Nobody else has read it. And he did give it the thumbs up afterwards. And he helped me with some of the, the law um, behind it as well. While I was writing, I asked him a few questions, like what do you call binoculars and things like that, you know, because <laughs> they've all got names. Everything's got like a different name. You can't just say binoculars. You have to say, I don't know, optical magnons or something. I mean, they've, they've all got weird names. Like, everything has got like a funny name. So, yeah. Like restricted in a different way. Yeah. I did wonder as well, Matthew, do you happen to be a Star Wars fan? Because in a time of swords, there's a line on page 143 uh, about um, a hive of scum and villainy. So uh, is it possible that you might be a Star Wars fan? Might be, yeah. <laughs> I might be, yes. I, I am actually a massive Star Wars fan. Um, so <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like going... But yeah, there's a, there's um there's a few other nods to um I don't, I'm surprised you didn't spot in the very first chapter there's um there's a, a nod to another sci-fi movie that um that somebody uh, one of the reviews one of the very early reviews said they couldn't read the book afterwards because they hit this bit that I'd I'd it's a it's not a quote it's not a direct quote but there's definitely um a, a nod to uh, it's in the first chapter of, of a time for swords so if you want to go back and read it and try and think about sci-fi movies and see what you think i'm not going to give it away but somebody wrote a review and said when i got to this bit it was terrible because you know it's written in the eighth century and it's got this thing about this sci-fi thing and i was like oh God, come on get a grip but anyway it's um yeah I, there's a few things I, I do in some of the benicia chronicles as well probably most of them there are little nods to um to rock songs as well i put in titles of rock songs in into bits but those get picked up less than the the lines from star wars and there was another star wars line in a time for swords that actually my beta readers said that's too on the nose you're going to have to take it out because basically there's an old hermit the old hermit on the on, on a on a um on an island that's waiting for the Vikings to come and they go and visit him and he's a really old man and he says I'm really old and um there's some bit I can't remember exactly the line um but he said something like you know look so good when you are 80 you will not or something it was just it was literally just like Yoda awesome. and um and they said you can't that's that's too much I think it's still in there something like that but it's a little bit less Yodery now <laughs> And when you said about the rock songs, because you you have done singing as well, I mean, part of a band. Yeah, yeah, I used to sing in a band. That's where the mic comes from. This is the leftovers from from singing in a band. So I thought I'm not going to throw away all my mics, get rid of them. I got rid of all my, my music gear recently because it was just cluttering everything up and wasn't using it but i thought a microphone's not big so i just got a a new interface to use it with the um with the laptop and it, it actually it makes it look like i'm a professional blogger or something you know vlogger but um podcaster but yeah so um so yeah i used to sing in a rock band called called rock dog which was like a joke name which ended up becoming the, the name because that's what always happens with bands as well and with books if you come up with a title and say this is the working title it ends up becoming the real title so i said to the band Oh, why don't we just call ourselves something, a uh, two name, you know, two words, something like rock dog, but you know, something else, not that. But then that was it. You <laughs> know, that, was, that, that, that was it, yeah. And it stuck. Yeah. Well, we'll see, we talked about the two series and your standalone book. Are you tempted? And I know you said you like quite like to keep it fresh to to you go and like write about these different characters. Have you got any plans to write another standalone? Because I think the initial one, your publishers asked you to do it so yeah yeah so I was actually talking to my editor last week for the release so I went into London for the um for the book launch and I've been toying with the idea of writing something totally different you know different time period and probably a standalone um 
a bit like Wolf of West, it's where you make it a standalone, but you can leave it open, you know, for you can always pick up and write a sequel to it after years if you want to, but um, probably aiming as a standalone. Um, and my editor was really up for the idea. So what I'm going to do is when I finish doing the edits for Forest of Foes that I'm writing now, I think I'm going to write the synopsis for the next A Time for Swords novel, try and think, spend a few weeks thinking about that. Also the next Bayer Brand Benicia Chronicles novel. And come up with a high level synopsis for a standalone novel and then see which one I want to tackle first and which one maybe the editor thinks I should tackle first and so we'll see but I think at some point I need to write something different I can't only write early medieval but there's all sorts of um, considerations so I, I, I basically got two editors and one editor um, was very against changing genre and it's like stick with what you what you do and everybody loves that whereas the other guy was more ah, it, it will be fine um, Let's, let's try something different. Why not? It's only one one book, you know. But so give it a whirl. We'll um, we had uh, another question for the event from John, who asked, Matthew, do you have a favourite historical figure? Oh, gosh, that's it. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, I was going to say no for a minute. I was going to say no. I, I don't. I don't. I can't think of any. But now I do think, and it's in a different time period than the one I I write about. But yes, my favourite historical figure was actually born on the same day as me but 150 years before me. Um, and it is uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton. And he was the man who discovered, well, he tried to discover the source of the Nile was one of the things that he did. He translated, um, I think he translated the, the Kama Sutra and things like that as well. Translated the Thousand and One Nights. He spoke 29 languages. He traveled to Mecca disguised as, a, as a, an Arab, as a, as, a, as a Muslim, when he could have been killed if he was, if he was um, discovered. I think he was the first non-Muslim to or, or non-Arab to travel to, to Mecca. Um, he, was, he was in India. He was all over the place. He was incredible. So, yeah, he's, he's my sort of hero. But, um, yeah. I've not got my cross in me. Sounds extraordinary. There's a, there's a movie. There was a movie. Uh, there's, there's obviously, there's biographies as well. Um, so... Uh, there's a movie called uh, The Mountains of the Moon, which is from probably about 30 years ago now, but it's a, it's a great movie, which tells part of the story of, his, of, his, of him going with um, uh, John Hanning Speak, and the two of them, Speak and, and Burton, um, travelled inland. So their idea was to travel inland in Africa to sort of hit the Nile where it's because it's going south, you know, so they, rather than traveling all the way down the Nile, they said, I think they're in sort of like, I don't know, my, my geography is terrible of Africa, but I think they're in Nigeria or something. They said, we're going to cross in inland from there and try and hit the Nile to discover the source of it. Um, and, and they, they, you know, a bit like me with the novel, they kind of underestimated quite how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> but these are, these are people in like the mid 19th century and nothing, you know, nothing phases them. So. Um, we had a question from Sarah about how on earth can you juggle so many different stories at once? And I think it's a brilliant question because when we have our, we have a monthly online book group and a lot of us read a lot of different books at the same time and you, you, you start getting a bit much, um, especially if they're in the same genre. So how do you do it? Well, I don't know. With great difficulty, I think, is, the, is probably the answer. And uh, I think the main thing is to try to only work on one thing at a time. I know other writers will, write, will be writing two novels at a time. Um, they'll spend like two days working on one novel and then two days working on a different novel. And then, you know, flip. And I, I, I don't think I could do that. I've never tried to because it just feels crazy. Um, so I will try to work on a novel for a few months, finish it and then edit it and then move on to the next to the next novel and I think that's the only way of doing it the, the, the difficulty with that is that I do have a sort of a, a finite amount of resource in my brain I think so when I move on to the next one I kind of tend to forget lots of the things that's happened in the previous one um, so I do take sort of lots of notes and I do have to go back and check a lot so when you write it that's that's actually that's the best thing about writing a standalone mm -hmm. is that you don't have to go back and check what color hair the person had or whether they've got a scar on the left cheek or the right cheek or whether they've got a limp or all these different things that when you're writing a series and characters recur you have to I have to go back and say so where was you know what what was wrong with this but I remember they had something you know they had a limp or something and is it the left leg or the right leg and I have to go back scrolling through and say, was it in book three or in book four you know so all of that so so taking good lots of notes is is helpful but I don't think that good. 
because it's a lot to keep track of. And when before yeah. we started, I said to Matthew about um, chatting to Lindsay Davis last year, and she said she has a database of all her characters because she knows if she misses it, the readers won't. Yeah, um, yeah. So they'll be like, no, as you just said, no, it's not his right cheek, it's his left cheek, Matthew, on Twitter. Yeah, I've got, got a, I've got a spreadsheet. I've got a spreadsheet of um, yeah. of the characters and, and I've, of Bear Brand's Warriors. I've got a spreadsheet in each each book has got a column and it's like, are they alive? Are they dead? Do they die? Do they, How do they, they, die? Do they get injured? Are they married? I've got these things like, are they married? Are they, have they got children? Where, you know, where are they in each book? Because they split up, you know, so one book, you know, one guy could be in Northumberland and another guy has gone to, to Cumbria or something. So that you've got to sort of just work out where everyone is so that in the future books, I don't, and I'm, I'm, par I'm paranoid that I'm going to include a character in like book nine, I've, I've got a small group of the warriors have traveled with bear brands. And I'm paranoid that one of them has died in a previous book and that I've forgotten. And then I, I think that would just be dreadful, but I mean, it's possible it could happen. I suppose I could be writing about characters and then they write, I hope, hope it doesn't happen, but it would be a lot of rewriting. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to, to finish off, Matthew. You said before, you've quoted a, a, a screenwriter that said, um, becoming a writer is like having homework every night for the rest of your life. Um, but what's one of the most awesome favourite, like your favourite things about being an author? What do you love about it? So I think that was Lawrence Kasdan who wrote some yes. of the Star Wars movies, actually. So bringing it back to that. Um, I think what do I like about it? I like the freedom... Um, uh, of being able to tell stories and to do what I want. I mean, I've, I've you know worked in an office job for years and years, and although I'm still in an office, um, this is it's more exciting than than you know doing the job that I was doing before. Um, I, I think I've always wanted to write. I always wanted to be in a creative job. I hadn't always wanted to be a writer, but I'd always wanted to be creative. So I wanted to be an actor when I was a, when I was younger, and then I, I sang in a band and I, I did art and stuff and and. I think the culmination of all those things um, means that, you know, at, at least in this way, I'm able to be creative. And I think partly, um, you know, one of the things I liked about, uh, I thought about this the other day, and I thought one of the things I liked about singing was that you have an immediate response and it's an immediate sort of gratification, I guess, and validation and people applaud and go, well done, you know, that's great. Writing is the same, but incredibly delayed so you still get that validation and it's still nice to get the approbation of people saying yes I really enjoyed that but it takes instead of like five minutes to sing the song it takes you six months and then another six months of for, before publication and then somebody will send you a, an email and say well that was well done you know well I, I enjoyed that so and you're like I'm writing the next one now what are you talking about yeah yeah <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. Uh, well, I just wanted to thank everyone that's joined us and that are catching up on our YouTube channel. We're always really grateful, Suffolk Libraries, for your support. And um, you can go to our website and find out about all our fabulous services, essential services that we offer. Um, when this event concludes and on our website for the remainder of the festival and beyond, we're going to have a link to purchase uh, Matthew's latest book, A Night of Flames. Mm. Obviously, if you've not read the first one, you need to go back one. But um, that's on there for you to order it's come out now last week so that's very exciting and and finally Matthew it's been it's been awesome like your t-shirt thank, t thank you so much <laughs> for joining us thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure and thanks to everybody for joining and um for donating money if they've donated to to Suffolk Libraries as well <laughs>